Hi, I'm Kubis van Rensburg. Join me now for Capturing Glory. We're going to go into the Word of God. We can now all come boldly to the very throne of God, which is the real mercy seat. Maybe we can start off by uh, a vision that most of you will know. Some of you that are foreigners, strangers, and aliens will not know. But in 1996, December month, you know, I, I had a vision. I always have visions in, in December. And, uh, uh, and I had a vision about, for those who can't remember, for those who do remember, I had a vision about this mountain. And there on the top was a man, and his mantle was just swaying in the wind, and he had a staff in his hand, and he was turning around, and he was walking very fast up this mountain. And here at the bottom, for lack of artistic abilities, and here, and here in the, it's modern art, here at the bottom was a river, a nice little stream, you know, and there was green, green grass of home, you know, and uh, all around the grass, people were lying and resting, and I heard Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. It makes me lie down in green pastures. And then a voice came to me and said, the only problem is all my people are lying in the green pastures and they don't know what they are lying there for. And then God spoke to me and he said, they, they go into the green pastures and the still waters to be refreshed and to be restored. You remember Psalm 23, he restores my soul. But after you've been restored, he leads you, okay? He leads you in the paths of righteousness, and that is an awesome word. Maybe we can touch a little bit on it again tonight. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay? So he leads me. So John 10.10 10 says, the good shepherd, you know, lay down his life for his sheep. And the good shepherd, his sheep will follow him because they know his voice. And then here at the top, I saw the face of the good shepherd turning around. And he was waving with his hand. And then this inscription came on. And no words. It, just, it, just, it was just letters. It wasn't a voice. And he said, let Let's go on to perfection. And the next minute, I couldn't see him anymore. And he was over the hill. And he said, how long are you going to lie there? We're going to stand up and go on to perfection. I thought, wow, we enjoy the green pastures. I mean, I mean, Louisa says, yeah. Okay, we enjoy the green pastures. We enjoy the still water. Yeah, we enjoy licking the water. But when are we going to go on? When are we going to go on to perfection? So he says in 1996, December, let's go on to perfection. And then he asked me the question, how long will you lie at the still waters in the green pastures? It's nice, but from time to time, you've got to get up and go on to perfection. Say to the person next to you, it seems like it's time to move. Right, Romans chapter 15. Now, the, now okay, are you there? Chapter 15, verse 13. Are you in verse 13? Okay, verse 13. Now the God of hope, now the God of hope. That's a good hope. Where's God? hope? Well, that's, that's hope's God. Okay, the God of hope. <laughs> the God of hope. Fill you. Now I want you to take note of the words that I want to emphasize because I want you to understand God has got more than just saving you from sin. He's got more for you in life than just getting you out of the mess you were in when you were a sinner. God has got more for you in life than just getting you saved, letting you die and go to heaven one day. God has got more for you in life than just knowing that your name is on the roll. You know, I believe in rock and roll. Jesus is a rock and my name is on the roll or something like that. Now, the God of hope fill you. Now, listen to this. And if you've got a voice, would you say amen if it sounds good? If it doesn't sound good, would you say tear it out? Okay. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy. And then, of course, all peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. 
And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren. Now listen to this. That you also are full of goodness. Filled with all knowledge. Able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ. Now tonight, by the grace of God, I trust that we're going to get some. Paul says, by the grace of God. By the grace of God. So how is Paul a minister? By the grace of God. What is he trying to say by this grace of God to the Roman church? That they are full of knowledge, full of hope, full of joy, full of knowledge, full of goodness. There is no lack, he says, and it's by the grace of God that I'm a minister to tell you that I'm sure that you are full of all goodness, full of all knowledge, full of all joy. Thank you. The excitement is making the angels leave their posts and go join somebody else because they know there's more there. But Let's go. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 3. Okay. Uh, verse 10. Okay. I'm just going to read. And if it seems like something is confirming something, would you make a noise? Even if it's just, mm, the dead, the dead shall not praise God. Isaiah 38. But the living, the living, yes, they shall praise the Lord. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds upon it. Amplified. Okay, so by the grace of God, what does he say? That is given to me. So he said it in the first place and he said it here in the second place. I just want to put this in brackets here. Given unto me. Okay, so what does Paul say? How can he minister? By the grace. How did he get the grace? It was given to him by the Almighty God. Now he puts another word in here. Maybe we can put this on the side because we will get to that just maybe before the end of the meeting. So we must watch out how we build. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Chapter 15, verse 9. This is going to be too much. For I am the least. I'm reading now the Amplified Bible for all the ones. For I am the least of all, least worthy of the apostles. Who am not fit or deserving to be called an apostle. Because I once wrong pursued and molested the church of God. Oppressing it with cruelty and violence. But by the grace of God. I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not for nothing. In fact, I worked harder than all of them. Though it was not really I. But the grace of God which was within me. If somebody can get it tonight, we're going to have a landslide of grace revival. By the grace, I am what I am. By the grace, I'm a minister. By the grace, I say what I say. By the grace given unto me. Every time, God gave me grace to minister. God gave me grace to be what I am. God gave me grace to tell you, you have all goodness, all fullness, all joy, all happiness, all whatsoever. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3, maybe another one. I can go on and on. I'm just trying to touch here and there what I can feel in my spirit. I'm your spirit word ministry. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Maybe this will be the last one before we go to the start of this whole story. I'll read the Amplified in Ephesians as well. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's free grace. Which was bestowed on me. By the exercise of his power. To me. <laughs> Though I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was granted and graciously entrusted. To proclaim the Gentiles. The unending, boundless, fathomless, incalculable and exhaustless riches of Christ. Wealth which no human being could have searched out ever, never, no, never, ever, so, whatsoever. Amen. By the grace. By the grace. It is given to me. It's been imparted unto me. It's bestowed on me. Uh, it's everything. I am what I am. It's by grace. He says, you know, I'm actually the least, but I'm actually the greatest, but by the grace. If I say I'm good, it's grace. He says, you know, I work more than any other saint. I say, oh, excuse me, it's not me, it's the grace. 
Okay? So what is Paul trying to say to us? I received grace. It was given to me. It was imparted to me. It was bestowed on me. So everything I do is because God gave me grace. That's why I have what I have, do what I do, say what I say. It's all because I received grace. Because we know that. Do we? Do we? So go to Acts 9 where it started. Because this is the life story of St. Paul of Assisi. I mean, that was St. Francis. <laughs> Forgive me, I'll just do it all alone. Now. Saint Paul of Damascus, Saint Cubus of Stolfontein, Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Anna of Lofto. Forget it. Okay, so, so. You know who Saul is? He's the man on the donkey that is hating the church. He's on his horse, maybe on a donkey, I don't know. I haven't read it yet. But he's somewhere on his way to persecute the Christian church. And he has just witnessed the stoning of Stephen. The people laid the clothes at Saul's feet. And he said, ready, aim, fire. You know, so Saul was a wicked man. And he had letters in his pocket to go put the Christians in chains to put them in prison and the Bible says you know he was breathing and snorting fire so he was between a man and a dragon some mix, mixture you know but the oh, no, I haven't got anybody sitting here this seems like people don't believe me it says it he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter you know? Yeah. verse 1 huh? so Paul was this man was upset with the church he was really upset <laughs> You know, he was snorting, breathing. That's Acts chapter 9. And this man is upset. The only mission he has is kill the Christians. Get them killed. On his way to Damascus, here comes a blinding light. Hits him, knock him off his horse. There he is lying. Jesus appeared to him. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you persecuteth. You know, go to the street called Straight. And here he gets up. Now he's blind. No, I'm not going to find the straight street. I can't even find a crooked one. You know, but they let him out. And while he is there in the house praying for three days. Okay. This is going to be great. Three days. For three days he's in that house blinded. In the meantime, there's another disciple by the name of Ananias. And in a vision, he saw a man by the name of Saul. And in a vision, he saw a man by the name of Ananias. So these two guys are visionaries. So they're both busy with visions. Mm -hmm. they have visions and in these visions they are getting revelations because in Acts chapter 26 when Paul is describing the story to the king he says oh king when I was on the way to Damascus I was slain by a blinding light and I came to visions and revelations and oh king I was never disobedient to the heavenly visions I had and the revelations given to me on that road so while Paul was lying there next to horse horse he was getting visions revelations so they led him to the street called straight so uh, so Paul because he was so crooked before he had to go to straight street so there is Saul in straight street and God is straightening him out for three days in the three days of straightening out God keeps him blind gives him more visions more dreams more revelations so Saul is getting revealed and while he's sitting there he sees in a vision a man by the name of Ananias laying hands on him Ananias sees in a vision a man named Saul and how he and Ananias is fighting he said no God I heard of this man how he's threatening the church and how is killing the people and now this is where we pick up the story verse 12 and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias and, and Ananias and, and, and Anna Ananias enter and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight but Ananias answered Lord I've heard much people many people tell about this man especially how much evil and what great suffering he has brought your saints in Jerusalem now he is here and has authority from the high priest to put in chains all who come upon, call upon your name but the Lord said to him go for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the descendants of Israel. For I will make clear to him. I think the Amplified said, uh, the King James said, I will show him. The one translation said, I have shown him. If you've got other translations there with you. I will make clear to him how much he will be afflicted. And how much he must endure and suffer for my name's sake. So before we read on, just look here and uh, look the holiest look. 
when you try to look holy before. Okay, so in those three days, Ananias receives a vision and God says, I will show. In other words, he will get visions and revelations. I will show how much he will be evil people. <laughs> I will show him what he has to go through. How much he must, he will, how much, you know. will somebody pray for me tonight. Okay, is that what your Bible say? Ananias, I will show him how much he will have to suffer, how much he will be attacked, how much they will zap him, put him in prison. I will give him visions and revelations what he must go through. Huh? I know where I'm going, so just stay with me. I, I know. I read the book before, so I know where I'm going. <laughs> I got the map and I know the place. Okay. So Ananias left and went into the house and he laid, laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, <laughs> you're from, from he's a persecutor to brother. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you along the way by which you came here has sent me so that you may recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he recovered his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. After he took some food, he was strengthened. And for several days afterward, he remained with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, how long? Immediately in the synagogues, he proclaimed Jesus, saying, He is the Son of God. I mean, three days early, he's persecuting the church. Three days later, he says, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ. Immediately. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the very man who arrested and overthrew and destroyed in Jerusalem those who called upon his name? And he has come here for the express purpose of arresting them and bringing them in chains before the chief priests. But Saul increased. All the more in strength. When? Immediately. Okay, is this years later or is this just after his salvation? How long after Paul's salvation did he increase? But Saul increased all the more in strength and continued to confound and put to confusion the Jews who lived in Damascus by comparing and examining evidence and proving that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, so immediately, not 10 years later, huh? oh, I wish somebody will get this, immediately he increased. Okay, immediately, not 10 years after his conversion, not just before his 25th anniversary in the gospel, not, you know, at his 31st, you know, a remembrance of being baptized in the Jordan. I mean, immediately. Maybe he was baptized in the pool. I don't know. Because the Bible says he was baptized in the house. Maybe in the bath. Maybe he had a shower. I don't know. But he was baptized immediately and immediately increased. I don't know where, I know where I'm going. Okay. So, are you with me? I'm not. Okay. Okay. If you're a visitor, the doors are locked. You can't get out. I just want to get myself back. Okay. Over and over, by the grace of God given to me, imparted unto me, bestowed on me, I'm a minister. I am what I am. I say what I am. I can do what I am. So, going back to where it all started, God knocked him off his horse. Three days kept him blind. In those three days, from the minute he was knocked off his horse, still Ananias appeared to him. You know, visions, revelations. And Ananias saw how Paul had revelations. Saul saw how Ananias saw he had visions and revelations. And he said, God, I can't go to this man. And then God said, I will show him what he must go through, what he must endure, how much he must suffer. I will show him everything. Okay? This is before he ever saw. Hmm? Now, after he saw, he immediately started preaching, immediately increased in strength, and immediately just rose and proved to everybody from the scriptures and with signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, verse 23. You know, well, Corpus takes an hour that you don't know what he's talking about, and then all of a sudden you know what he talked about. So just stick with me. My preachings are like puzzles. Maybe you never see it before I put that last block in. And after that, verse 23 now. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. Now this is many days after he got saved. This guy just doesn't stop increasing and growing and teaching Jesus Christ. But their laying a weight was known of Saul. I will show him. <laughs> I will show him whatever is going to come to him. 
So um, many, he preached, preached, preached. After many days, the Jews tried to kill him, but it was known unto Saul what was going to happen to him. Okay, okay. But their laying away was known of Saul, King James Version. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. <laughs> but he knew it, so they couldn't kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Everybody say, in a basket, a few days after salvation. You saw it was the same instance. It wasn't years later. Okay, just look, okay. You see, the story is his salvation. Knocked off his horse, visions and dreams. Ananias come. I will show you how much he will suffer for me. Then the Jews tried to kill him, but he already knew it. So the disciples came, lady in a basket and dropped him in a basket in the wall. It's just a few days after he got saved. He was immediately persecuted, but he immediately increased. And when they tried to kill him, he already knew they want to kill him. So he got escaped because he knew. Second Corinthians 11. Man, this is going to bless you out of your anything. Keep your clothes on. But the rest you'll be stripped from. You know, religion. Second Corinthians 11. We're going to put a scripture in perspective tonight that's going to change your whole view of religious activities. Second Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11. I didn't add any. Okay. Verse 24. We're just going to read a few scriptures. The time, by the time I preach the message, you, you get it. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes. What have you gone through lately? Okay, just look at me and look blessed. Uh, when last were you in the church square and getting 40 lashes from the police? 40. Five times. That's a lot of lashes, man. Okay. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. No, they didn't stone you to play. They stoned you to kill. Okay. Three times I've been aboard a ship. Wrecked at sea. A whole night and a day I've spent adrift on the deep. Many times on journeys. Exposed to perils from rivers. Perils from bandits. Orlando pirates. Perils from my own nation. Perils from the Gentiles. Forgive me. Perils in the city. Are you here? Perils in the desert places. Perils in the sea. Perils from those posing as believers, but destitute of Christian knowledge and piety. In toil and hardship, watching often through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, frequently driven to fasting by want, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing. Besides those things that are without, there is a daily inescapable pressure of my care and anxiety for all the churches. Oh, here are so. Thank you. My name is not Saul of Tarsus. Or Paul of Damascus. Okay, uh, would, you, would you just ask forgiveness for all the stuff that you're complaining about lately? Okay, that, that is your list of, that is your checklist for the next week. <laughs> Have I been shipwrecked? Have I been thrown in the deep? Have I been beaten by rods? Have I been lashed, 39 lashes? Okay, uh, no, 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 no. And then you've got to say hallelujah. <laughs> Okay. Hmm? That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. This is so, you know, you know, have, have, has any of that checklist occurred in your life? Not even one. But, oh, brother, I tell you, we've been going through stuff. You know, we are going through stuff. What have you been doing? Have you been through the checklist? Huh? But, oh, brother, I tell you, you know, the church, oh, man, we're going through. We are, we are, no, there's a lot of stuff happening to us. You haven't even found number one on the checklist. So what are you going to preach tonight? Christian suffering. No, I'm going to preach on let's go on to perfection. <laughs> okay. 
Okay? Now listen to what Paul says about this stuff. Who is weak and I do not feel his weakness? Who is made to stumble and fall and have his faith hurt? And am I not on fire with sorrow or indignation? Verse 30. If I... Verse 30. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30. Okay? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my infirmity, of the things by which I am made weak and contemptible in the eyes of my opponents. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ knows. He who is blessed and to be praised forevermore, I do not lie. Paul, what are you trying to tell us? Now he's going back to conversion. In Damascus. The city governor acting under King Aratus guarded the city of Damascus to arrest me. And I was actually let down in a rope, a basket through a window in the wall, and I escaped through his fingers. Now you've got to, if you are not running with me tonight, you're going to miss one of the most precious words that God has ever wanted to give you. Okay? I especially told you how Paul says, it's all by grace. By grace, by grace I am what I am. By grace I can say what I say. By grace I, grace I have this ministry. Over and over and over. He said, it's by grace you've got to realize how to build. For three days, he was there with visions and dreams. And God says to Ananas, I will show Paul exactly what he must go through. A few days later, they dropped him in a basket. Still in Damascus. Just stay with me. I've got about 20% of the crowd. Okay. He's still in Damascus. He hasn't left the place yet. He's still preaching his conversion message. He's still in his birth state. But in his birth state, he's increasing immediately. In his infant baby shoes, Paul is showing to everybody, all the Jews, all the Greeks, everybody, he's proving that Jesus is the Christ in every fashion. He's increasing, he's growing by leaps and bounds. And he says, but grace, grace, grace. And he says, man, uh, because God showed me, they want to kill me. But he was known to me, so I was dropped in a basket. So years later, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been thrown in the deep. I've been lashed. I've been this. I've been this. And he's trying to say everything that occurred on the way. He says, uh, so when I was in Damascus, they even dropped me in a basket. So Paul is trying to show what happened to him going right round in the circle back to his conversion? He said, all that stuff was shown me beforehand what's going to happen to me and what I'm going to go through. Huh? Would you like to know everything you're going to go through? Everybody says, no. I say, I don't care a damn. That sounds too bad. Okay, let's rewind that. That sounds ugly. What do you say? Don't say it loud because you're going to feel bad afterwards. Just look holy. Just say anything. Just look at me. Like you do all night. Mm -hmm. Would you like to know in advance? Now Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. All the stuff that happened his whole lifetime. Ending up where he started off. In the basket. That was his first trial. That was his first persecution. That was his first. But he refers to everything that ever happened. But going back to Ananias, I will show him. Hmm? Chapter 12. True. True. He's still telling the same story. Okay, anybody with me? He says, it's true, there is nothing to be gained by it. But as I'm obliged to boast, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Okay? Paul says, listen man, I'm not boasting of what I'm going through. I just try to tell you, if you think you are great, let me tell you what I've been through. Okay, you're going to get a picture tonight that's going to shake your idea of Christianity and it's going to put you in a place of maturity. Okay, Paul says, listen, by the way, you get these apostles that are telling you how they suffer? Let me start first by saying, I am the least, but I'm actually the greatest. If they think they've labored, I've labored more than all of them. But you know what I do? I give the credit to God's grace. But these guys come and they want to take your money. They want to prove that they are apostles. He said, let me tell you, I am actually a Hebrew. I'm actually of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, man, I'm a Roman and a Jew. He said, let me tell you more. If they think they're apostles, let me tell you what I went through. He said, I've been lashed. I've been beaten. I uh, see I've got your attention now. I've been through this. I've been through that. And he goes right back to his first persecution. Yeah. Dropped in a basket. 
He says, so I will glory in these weaknesses. Does that mean Paul says, oh, I've been beaten thrice. No, Paul is trying to prove a point. He says, if they think they are good, let me tell you what I've been through. So if I want to glory, I can tell you I've been through more than any other Christian that is alive today. I've been through more than all of them. He says, will I boast in that? He says, no. But when it comes to boasting, let's go to the visions and the dreams. Let's go to the revelations. Okay? okay? You're going to see a thing now that's going to rock your boat, baby. Verse 2. <laughs> I know a man in Christ 14 years ago. Referring to himself on the road to Damascus for those who made the study and listened to the study I made. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up to the third heaven. I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise. And he heard utterances beyond the power of man to put into words which man is not permitted to utter. Of this man's same man's experience, I will boast. But of myself personally, I will not boast, except as regards my infirmities, my weaknesses. Talk about the same man. But he's trying to prove a point that we're going to prove tonight. I, you don't know the point yet because I haven't put my cards on the table yet. Verse 6. Should I desire to boast, I shall not be a witless braggart, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I am stained from it, so that no one may form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me or hears from me. Are you ready? Keep your finger there and go to Acts chapter 20. Man, you don't know what's happening tonight. But when I put that stuff on the table, you're going to be freaky freaky, man. We're going to call you freaky. Verse 20 says, he says how he served the Lord. Then he says, I did not shrink from telling you anything that was for your benefit and teaching you in public meetings and from house to house. But constantly and earnestly I bore testimony both to Jews and Greeks, urging them to turn in repentance to God and to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now you see, I am going to Jerusalem bound by the Holy Spirit. And obligated and compelled by the convictions of my own spirit, not knowing what will befall me there. Except that the Holy Spirit clearly and emphatically affirms to me in every city after city that imprisonment and suffering awaits me. Okay, keep it there. I will show him what he must go through for me. He says, I don't know what I'm going to, but I know the Holy Spirit in every city said, you're going to prison, you're going to suffer. He says, so I don't know what's going to happen, but I know I'm going to prison. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know, man, there's imprisonment and suffering awaiting me. Yeah. Huh? Are you ready? Everybody says, Paul knew ahead of time. He's going to go to prison and he's going to suffer. Five times. 39 lashes. Three times beaten with rods. Stoned, thrown in the deep sea, shipwrecked. Come on, people, that's the checklist. Yeah. Sure, I've got so many faces. If I can have a camera and put every face on Snap now and send it to your mother. <laughs> okay, so Paul says, uh, he immediately increased after his salvation. Increase, increase, increase. Strength, knowledge, wisdom, he just increased, man. Still in Damascus. They wanted to kill him, but it was known unto Paul. So he was dropped in the basket. So years later, 14 years later, Paul refers to that incident. He says, man, I, I'm going to tell you where I started, but let me first go through my life until now. This is what I've been through until now. If you think somebody's through anything, they've been through nothing, brother. Look at me. So I can boast in that weaknesses. But when it comes to boasting, let's go to visions and revelations. He says, I know what happened that day on the Damascus, how I got those visions and revelations. Okay? Now Paul comes and he says, ha. every city they said, you're going to suffer, you're going to be in prison. You're going to suffer, you're going to be in prison. I see somebody say, I didn't come for this message. I come to be healed. This is what I'm doing now. I'm bringing you healing. I'm bringing you the greatest healing message you ever heard in all your life. Are you ready? Every city, you're going to be imprisoned, you're going to, you're going to be suffering. Okay? Verse 24. Now this has got to fall in your heart, otherwise I've wasted everything up till now in 26 years of ministry. But none of these things move me. No.
Paul, they're going to put you in prison. She said, what? I saw the vision that day when I got saved. Somebody's going to get it here tonight. He said, none of these things, if they come and say, Paul, they're going to put you in prison. Paul, you're going to be for that king tomorrow. Paul, they're going to whip you tomorrow. I said, so that doesn't move me. I'm bound by the Holy Spirit. I've got a vision. I've got a passion. I've got a revelation. He says, so you know what I am? Everything that I am is by the grace of God. Everything I say is by the grace. Wherever I go is by grace. I've got a revelation of grace. So I don't care what they're going to do, how they're going to do, when they're going to do. I knew before the time what's going to happen. But I had a revelation of the grace. That's why this stuff doesn't move me at all. Because I have a revelation of grace. So you're going to see it in a while. And when that penny drops tonight, you're going to be rich. But none of these things move me. I don't doesn't make sense yet because I haven't preached the sermon yet. Neither do I esteem my life dear to myself. If only I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have obtained from which was entrusted to me by the Lord Jesus faithfully to attest to the good news of God's grace. Hmm? He says, this stuff doesn't move me because the passion is I must go tell people about the grace. So it's by the grace that I am, by the grace that I say, by the grace that I preach, by the grace that I minister. So because of this grace, I've been shown everything, but thank God he first showed me grace. Then he showed me this. And because he showed me this, this doesn't move me at all. Because I had visions and revelations of this, but I had visions and revelations of grace. Hmm? Chapter 12. It's going to fall. Yeah, chapter 12, 2 Corinthians. That's where we had our fingers, didn't we? Did I say, take your finger out? No, yeah. Oh, where not? 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 7. I hope it's going to help you now. And to keep me from being puffed up. And too much elevated by the exceeding greatness of these revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to wreck me, to buffet me, to harass me, <laughs> to keep me from being excellent. Shall we close our Bibles and go home? We'll come back tomorrow night for episode two. <laughs> Just take another drink. I want to pause now because if I start preaching now, it's going to be so quick, so fast. It's going to, it's going to maybe shipwreck you. But you're going to be shipwrecked from religion. You're going to fall in God's ocean of grace. Where were we? <laughs> A thorn. Numbers 33, Joshua 23, Judges 5. You know, Second Samuel, over and over God says, these people that you didn't deal with will be thorns in your side. Remember? Yeah. Funny that word thorns, we go over to the New Testament. It's not used so much, but here. But there's another word used, pricks. What does a thorn do? It pricks you. When Saul was on the road to Damascus and he said, Who are you, Lord? What did Jesus say to him? I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And what did he say to him? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Have you ever thought what is God trying to tell? You see, but because nobody explained it to you, we just read it over. And we don't give it meditation. What on earth is God saying? Man, it's going to hit you in a while. It looks like click, 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 click. Lord, help me tonight, Jesus. Chris Christopherson, please sing for me. Lord, help me, Jesus. Okay, it's hard. 
I wish I can sometimes get you into my mind and just share a little bit of my, my room. You freak out, man. Okay. He says, not to exalt myself above the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to buffet me and harass me. But on that road, when he first met the Lord, in the first two minutes after salvation, or whenever, God said, it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to kick against thorns. So, that's there. He's busy getting saved. This is not 10 years later. Okay, just stick with me. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Hmm? Is it there in your Bible? Is it there? What does it say? Ah, oh. so I'm Jesus. It's hard for you to get against the pricks. Is Jesus the prick? It's when he said, I'm Jesus. The second revelation is, it's hard for you to get against the pricks. So here is Saul. He said, I had visions and revelations. He said, but to not be exalted, I was given a thorn. Okay. Now, I said numbers 33... Joshua 23, Judges 5, 2 Samuel, over and over it says, the people that you didn't deal with will be thorns in your side and in your eyes. So who harassed Paul? Peter, people. Okay? It's not angels. Okay, please. Okay, anybody that can still talk, say people. people. Thank you. Okay, who, who persecuted him? People. Who put him in prison? People. Who tried to kill him? People. So who was his thorns? People. Okay. So what did God say to him the minute he realized this is Jesus? He said, so I'm Jesus. But from now on, it'll be hard for you to get, get kick against the pricks. Okay. This is his first word from the Lord. I really, now please. This is his first revelation. Paul is hard to get kick against pricks. So here's Ananias praying. God says, Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer. So he's preaching in Damascus. He's increasing immediately. But it was known unto him that they want to kill him. So he was dropped in a basket. So when he writes to the Corinthian church, he says, I was dropped in a basket. So what is he referring to? The day when he got saved and that first few days of his salvation. Okay? He says, and I had dreams and revel- I had visions and revelations. But not to be exalted, I was given a thorn. When did God say it's hard to kick against the pricks? The day of salvation. So that day God gave me revelations and said, but you're also going to have a thorn in the flesh. It's hard for you to get the same word. I'm Jesus. It's hard to kick against the pricks. Ananias, I will show him. Paul knew immediately everything that was happening to him. Please get it. So here says Saul, not to be exalted above the revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh. People would harass me. People, but what does he say? He says, it doesn't move me at all. Right? Can we clap? Okay, let's go on. Where did he get that revelation? On the road. Mm-hmm. To keep me, that was given. Is, it, is the context the day on the Damascus road? Because that's where he ended. Okay? Three times, I called upon the Lord and besought him about this, and begged that it might depart from me. But he said to me, My grace is enough for you. If you don't get this tonight, I've wasted 26 years of ministry. I'm giving you the greatest revelation to get you out of what we're going through, what the mess we are, how people are persecuting, what are they doing to me? Look at the mess, how this guy's trying to do this, how that one's splitting the church. It'll take you out of everything because it wasn't 14 years later. Paul is referring to 14 years earlier. When I was there next to my horse, horse, I had visions, I had revelations. And God said, but Paul, don't get above these revelations. You're going to have a thorn. But Paul says, so right, right, but that doesn't move me at all because he showed me what I will go through. But he said that grace will be there. So Paul, it's hard to kick against the pricks. In other words, don't worry about the thorns. Saul, I'm telling you the day of salvation. Don't let the thorns ever trouble you. My grace is sufficient for you. Saul, this is going to start your ministry. This is going to take you right through till you say the crown has been laid up for me. Saul, if you get what I'm telling you here next to a little horsey. 
The one that gets this revelation will understand me. If you don't understand anything else, at least you'll understand me. What are we going through? Nothing. There's my wife, there's my sons. Nothing. Look what they did. It's nothing. Look at this. It's nothing. Look at this struggle. Where? Okay, I'm not hitting the right button now, but somebody will somewhere get it. Paul says, when I was next to a horsey, I saw visions. Ah, oh, ah, oh. but Ananias saw it too. And God said, Ananias, I will show this man exactly what's going to happen. I was, wow, look at that. I'm getting the mysteries of the Christ, the revelation of the sons. I'm getting all the, he said, what? Saul, so you're going to have thorns. But don't kick against the pricks. Oh Lord, please take it away. Please Lord, take it away. Three days. Saul is crying out. He's blind. He's crying out. Oh Lord, no, I don't, I'm not seeing. He said, wait, Saul, so, whoa, 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 whoa. Before we start the ministry, it's grace. So by the grace, I am what I am. I do what I do. By the grace, I can glory. I can be weak. I can be strong. I can be poor. I can be rich. It's all by grace. So he starts every single epistle. Grace be unto you. Ends every epistle. Grace be unto you. Every single epistle somewhere. By the grace of God, I am. By the grace of God, I can. By the grace of God, I But he said to me, my, I wanted anybody to see the context. It was not when he went through something that God said, my grace is a fee. It was the day of his salvation. But he said to me, my grace is enough for you. Sufficient against any danger. And able to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled, and completed. And show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses. My infirmities. That the strength and the power of Christ the Messiah may rest. Yes, may pitch the tent over me. May dwell upon me. So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased. I take pleasure in infirmities. Insults. Hardships. Persecutions, perplexities, distresses. For when I am weak in human strength, then am I truly strong, able, powerful in divine strength. If you ever heard in your life a message on grace, you heard it tonight. The key to understanding revelation has been dropped in your hand tonight to understand all the epistles that the Apostle St. Paul wrote and left us. If you understand tonight what happened that day, where he got this revelation, you will never, never again go through stuff. You will find out if you're in this ministry, I don't agree with the doctrine of stuff. And we've got to go through and we've got to face, we've got to have this, we've got to have this. God says, this is part of the deal when you signed. When you sign, this is the package you got. There will be thorns, but don't be a thorn. There will be thorns, but don't kick against the thorn. That is just part of the road. Everybody's still looking like. What moves you? The prickly pears? Or the grace of Almighty God? So, the people that are in the pulpit that's supposed to be motivational speakers instead of preachers, would tell you all the stuff we're going through. And then everybody would stand through the service. They will not sit because they can't sit because everybody can identify. <laughs> but not anybody can identify with visions and revelations. Not anybody can identify with the grace. But anybody can identify with stuff. So if I can come preach on all the rubbish we go through, I got everybody's attention and we all will stand all night long and say, yes, amen. Preach it, brother. That is good. No, that's not good. We're all on this earth and it's filled with thorns. God said this earth will bring forth thorns and thistles. It's very quiet in this Presbyterian church right now. But if I must now preach, listen, brothers and sisters, when you face this, this is what we all face. Amen. Yes. 
Now the world outside, especially the religious world, they would, yes, amen. Brother, if you go through hardships, I want to tell you that God has planned for us to be persecuted and troubled. Oh, yeah, amen. And I can touch your soul and we all sing the sermon to each other. Because it makes us feel good to know everybody's going through the same stuff. But what about somebody tells us, this stuff is not supposed to move you. You're not supposed to kick against it. It's not supposed to trouble you. You're supposed to say, when that stuff comes, I will glory in it. Because I understand beforehand that God has said before it came, my grace will carry you through. No matter what comes, grace will be there. But you see, the attention is on the stuff and not on the grace. That's why we go through stuff. Waar blijf die skap? Tel die skap goed blijf. Dan word ek die mocht nou, is dit Walter? Is dit die koei? Word die skap. Well, Hebrews 5 and 6. Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 6. I told you when I preached at that pastor's conference in Nailstrom, Stock is dry when I preach the sermon called So What? And I talked on all the stuff that preachers go through. So to get all of them to agree with me for a change. The sermon was called So What? And I had them say So What? Later on, they were screaming So What? So when we had lunch, I just heard from table, oh, So What? Man? So What? Nobody was talking to nobody. They said, so What? So I think they had so much food for it. So I, they were just going through their assemblies. <laughs> so what, man? So what, Elder Jones? So what, Sister Susie? So what, so what, man? So, but if that stuff becomes the drawing point, if that stuff becomes the moving factor, if that stuff becomes the factor in your life, you've lost your spiritual battle. People that understand grace start off like that. But very few stay like that. I remember the first night, 2000, when we went there to Prophet T.B. Joshua, there was a newspaper article in his church. My persecution brought me my anointing. I said, our brother, he said, grace. It helped me understood grace. He said, if it's not for grace, I will react. But because of grace, I leave them. Hmm? Come on, last year when the newspapers and the magazines were full of us, how I still get rich from the poor. You know, how will the poor make somebody rich? They can't even feed themselves. How will they make me rich? So does prophet get rich from the poor. Healing hands full of gold. It was easy, but it was my picture, you know. And they didn't say, so does spirit word get money. They said, so prophet gets money. Hmm? Inside, my crucifix around my neck, my gold chain around my arm, my CLK 500. Hmm? Man, did I write them a letter. <laughs> yo, kwas, yo, mampara, yo, vrum, yo, farik, yo, popo, yo, pisang, yo, tamati, yo, guar, yo, ah, yo, man. I mean, I saw the flames coming out of that letter. I saw, I smelled the sulfur. <laughs> I smelled burning hide as I wrote that letter. Email. The You magazine. Send. God says, where are you going to send it to? I said, to the You. The Ace God says, the right hand corner, there's another button. It says, delete. <laughs> Did you read the newspaper? <laughs> said, before the foundation of the world, I read it. So it's given me a thorn. Don't kick against the pricks. They are thorn. I know. Delete. So I wrote them a letter. Thank you for the good publicity you gave to us as a ministry. 
We are overloaded with emails that we can't handle the response. Thank you very much. Etc. And uh, man, I felt my wings grow out. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Have you checked the checklist? What have you been going through lately? Oh man, this stuff that we're going through. Oh man, this whole city is against us. Oh man, the, oh the part. Ah oh, man. Oh. Did you know we just had thousand leaders here? With the biggest amount of full-time preachers ever. The crowd was not 1,300 like September. It was a little less. But they were more full-time preachers than any time. I think any place in South Africa. Hmm? Hmm? So, uh, what have you been going through? I wanted to say something, but I'll just leave that. Chapter 5 of Hebrews. I told you. There's a preacher in a city close by, not too close by. Oh, yeah, what I wanted to say is we had the thousand preachers here. Not one from the area. Okay? Not one from this area. Yeah. Thousand leaders plus minus 800 full-time preachers. Not one from this area. Why? Because they've got nothing good to say about this church. It's an antichrist place. It's a false apostle. It's a false prophet. It's a demonized place. This is not really signs and wonders. We buy the people to make like they're walking and stuff like that. You know? So what? It doesn't move me what they say. It's the grace that moves me. Hmm? Somebody will get it. Sometime. Okay, chapter 5. Verse 12. How long are we? Oh, I'm preaching too long. How long have I been preaching? <laughs> right. Verse, verse 12. For even though, for even though, for even though, verse 12, yes. For even though, by this time, you ought to be teaching others. You actually need someone to teach you over again. The very first principles of God's word. You have come to need milk and not solid food. Do you know of another place where Paul wrote the same story? First Corinthians chapter 3. You are in need of milk. You are like babies in Christ. You lack no spiritual gift, but you babies. You say, I'm Paul. Other ones, you know, I'm of Apollos. Other ones, you know, I'm of Peter. He says, hey, who died for you? Who paid the price for you? Paul? Peter? Apollos? He says, hey, wait, 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 wait. The same chapter he talks about how being built by the grace of Almighty God. By the grace of God, I, I laid the foundation of a master. It's a master builder, okay? Okay. When did Paul increase? Immediately. Please. When did he increase? Hmm? How long did it take him to grow spiritually? Okay. For by the time you all need to be teaching others, but now somebody need to teach you again. For everyone who continues to feed on milk, here comes our message for tonight, or part of it, is obviously inexperienced and unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness. But solid food is for full-grown men, those whose senses and mental faculties are trained by practice. I don't want to go on there. I want to go to chapter 6. But just one word here. Paul says, If you understand the word of righteousness, you can eat solid food. You don't say you matured. It will only make the food available. So what is the word of righteousness? It's that you can't grow in righteousness. You are made righteous. You can't become righteous. You are made righteous. 
Righteousness is imputed. Righteousness is accounted. Righteousness is accredited. Abram believed. It was counted, credited, imputed righteousness. So that we who are believed are children of Abram and heirs according to the promise. What are we? God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we can be made righteous. Somebody will get this. So if I understand, hey, I don't grow to become righteous. If I say yes to Jesus, the minute I stand up, I'm righteous. I could have been a sinner 10 minutes ago, but right now I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm righteous. I can maybe sin again, but that doesn't make me a sinner again. Try that. I can maybe sin again, but that doesn't make me a sinner again. Try once more. That, we, that can make a nice poster. I may be sin again, but that doesn't make me a sinner again. So, uh, those who he has qualified, those who he has declared fit, those who he had justified, those who he made righteous, you are justified, you are righteous, you are fit, you are qualified, you are accepted in the beloved. You can't do anything to get accepted, you can't do anything to be justified, you can't do anything to be righteous. You've got to understand the word of righteousness that takes you out of milk. And put you in a place where you can at least eat solid food. It doesn't declare you are, you are mature. But it puts you in a place where you can eat the food of mature people. That will make you mature. Chapter 6. Back to our vision of 1996 December. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'll just jump everything to verse 7, not to make you intimidated tonight. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it, and bring forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is, it is dressed, and it receives blessing from God. Just look this way. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Isaiah 55, 10, 11. It shall do what I send it for. It shall be prosperous therein, and it shall not return unto me void. So the earth, we are made from earth. Let thy kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is within us. Okay? We have the treasure in earthen vessels. We are the earth. But the earth out there is talking about you and me. Huh? The earth that receives the rain. The word. The, so shall my word be. Like the rain that comes down from heaven, so shall my word be. The earth that received the rain to bring forth herbs and meat. Solid food. Solid food. Okay. Will bring blessings from God. It shall not return void. Have you got that? Yes. Verse 8. But that which beareth thorns is rejected and nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burnt. Okay. I'll just leave it there. I will leave it there. Okay? I'll just leave that portion there. There are people amongst you that will receive the rain as much as you receive the rain. But instead of bearing fruit for meat that will bring forth blessing, they will bring forth thorns. Now, we know what brings forth thorns. He says, just going on to chapter 12 and 13, do not let a root of bitterness come up in you. And then he says what this root of bitterness will do. We discussed it from Proverbs and we discussed it from Psalms. It'll bring forth thorns. So bitterness brings forth thorns. So you can be either a flower in God's grace garden or you can be a thorn. So Paul, I'm going to give you some thorns amongst you. But don't kick against the pricks. Realize that they are receiving the rain in vain. But you trust my grace. And I will lift you up and elevate you. And this stuff will not move you at all, Paul. Just know it's everything is grace. 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 And there falls the water. Not the waterfall. There falls the water. Okay. And because of that. Phew, you don't have to grow into maturity. Nicodemus asked Jesus, can a man be born? Can a man, can, can there be birth given to a man? Okay. 
for those who don't hear, get the message, can a man be born? When uh, Jesus went to the cross, he said, you will be filled with sorrow tonight. But your sorrow will be turned into joy. Like when a woman gives birth to a child, she's filled with sorrow. But when a man is born, she's filled with joy. Okay? Revelation 12, a man child was born. Okay? Can a nation be born in one day? Hmm? Can a man, can you be full grown born? (laughs) Saul increased immediately. He immediately understood grace. He immediately didn't care what's going to happen to him. He didn't grow into it. He had it right from the very first day. Somebody need to help me now with shout to scream. That's why he could wrote all those awesome letters. Can anybody see it tonight? Anybody? So this brings us to the message of this morning, three o'clock. Which I touched on this morning, which is actually the message for tonight. But I had to have this long runway because it's our big plan. It's got an awesome lot of tires and big motors. and It's got a long way to go. Eternity. Ice Age, what have you been going through? What are you going through? What are you majoring on? What's in your mind in your Christian life? Stuff that people did to you or what grace did to you? If you must tell your story, will you tell what you went through or will you tell the grace? If somebody asks you how is it, will you tell them stuff or will you tell them grace? But I'm asking you the question tonight. What happened to you in your Christian life? Hmm? I'm reaching about half the crowd here. But maybe for future reference. This is what I asked the people this morning. And a couple of years ago, I preached a sermon. It was in Afrikaans. It was before we got anointed from heaven. Forget that one. Hmm? (laughs) God spoke to me in this fashion. Can I go on? Who's the, who's the tension if I still go? God, that's good. I just want to see if I'm still your favorite preacher. No, I, don't know. I don't know what to say. Grace. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to prove the message in some way. God spoke to me about eight years ago, and I preached this sermon. And last night, or early this morning, I can't remember, God reminded me of it. God showed me the 42nd chapter of Job. In chapter 1, the Bible says, Job was the richest man in the East, and he was blessed in all his doings. And God said he was a just and a righteous man. Job, righteous, just, blessed, the richest. Job, chapter 1. Later on, chapter 1, Satan comes on the scene. He says, hey, Job, hey. Okay, so he started losing everything. And in chapter 8, one of the prophets came to him and said, Job, although your beginning was very small, just, righteous, Blessed the riches, though your beginning was very small. Well, thank you, brother. Song at least is doing this. It's it's good. Thank you. Okay, though your beginning was very small, the riches, blessed, righteous, just. Though your beginning was very small, your latter end shall greatly increase. So his wife says, curse God. His friend says, Job, this. and Yeah, he gets all sorts of prophecies. The 42nd chapter, Job stands up and he says, I've heard of you and I've messed it up. Now I repent.
I repent of what I said. It's all. And God turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes. And he had double as much as he had before. Hmm? What have you said in your life? Oh, God, look at this mess. Oh, yeah, who come with Okay, no worry. Hmm? And then God spoke to me. It was about eight, nine years ago. We can look at the tape. The tape is there at the back. And God said to me, this is the amount of chapters that was written about Job's life before he repented. How many chapters do you want to be written, have written about your life before you change? Okay, I'm just asking the question that God asked me eight years ago and again during the course of last night. God said, go ask the people, how many chapters must be written before you repent? Repent of what? That God is good and he's gracious. How many chapters do you still want to be written before you're going to stop saying what you're going through, what's happening to you, how the mess is around you, what people are doing to you, or are you going to say, by the grace of God? But if you really want to know, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been lashed, I've been thrown in the deep sea, I can tell you what I went through. But that stuff does not move me. But you know what moves me? The grace of God. That's how I was called. That's what he said to me in the beginning. Oh, my father, I'll hear you. <sighs> You'll never forget this night. You know? What type of preacher is this? Hoi water op tel op. Walk around like a drunk man. I feel drunk. I feel intoxicated. Maybe it's a chalk. No, it's not. I didn't sleep. I... They once said I'm, I'm allergic to chalk. I mustn't write on the blackboard. Maybe I should eat the stuff. It'll kick the stuff out. Okay, but where are we? Okay, how many chapters? That's where we were. 42 chapters before Job repented. How many chapters have been written in your life? I, I don't know if I'm going to reach anybody, but how many chapters have you got in your little book of what you went through, what people did to you, what happened to you, how you've been treated? How many chapters do you still need to be written before you get restored, refreshed, and then go on to perfection? How many chapters? Okay, four. Nobody gets it. Here comes the message. So, uh, in Matthew chapter 1, we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It says, 14 generations from Abram to David. 14 generations from David to the Babylonian captivity. 14 generations from the Babylonian captivity to Christ. That makes it 42. Okay? But reading the names gives you only 41. For those who ever heard the message of the Christ generation. 41. Then it goes on to say, and all these people were wicked people. You, we, you heard the message. That whole genealogy of Jesus Christ, the name's name. They were wicked. They sold the temple's gold. They were prostitutes. They were whoremongers. They sold their fathers and mothers out. They were wicked. And he said, under these circumstances were born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So what? That doesn't move me at all. Doesn't matter where you're coming from, what you went through, what you are going through. Do you want to be the generation of Christ? So the 42nd generation is the second man people. As we bore the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Okay? Do you want to be the Adam man or do you want to be the Christ man? 42nd generations. The 42nd generation is the generation of Christ. So you can go through 42nd generations or can a man be born? Okay? Somebody will get it. So tonight you can't leave before you, if you haven't listened to that message, can a man be born in the generation of Christ? What's the one that I preached four weeks ago about the generation five weeks ago? Remember? Okay. What's the one? Faith, Sheila, Susie, my Okay, okay, whatever. 
When I preached on the genealogies and said under these circumstances, a few weeks ago I preached another one. Nobody remembers tonight, so we'll wake you up tomorrow morning. Okay? But get those tapes and listen to the 42nd generation, the Christ generation. Can a man be born? Okay? So you don't have to grow steadily into it. You can be what God has planned for you to be. Hmm? Then last night, it must have been past three o'clock. So uh, the only Bible I could find was the previous night. The only Bible I could find was a new Afrikaans translation of 1983. I don't know what happened to all the other Bibles, but that Bible is now really scratched. And then I sat up straight and God said, 42nd generation. Do you want to have it or do you want to grow into it? I said, Lord, I don't want one chapter written in my life. You know, this is not the stuff that moves me. And then God started speaking to me. Without the Bible, then afterwards I took the Bible. He says, imagine Psalm 42. Oh Lord, my soul thirsts for thee. My flesh long for thee. Oh Lord, they say to me all day long, where is your God? But when I hear the sound of the water, the deep cries out to the deep at the sound of thy waters. And they say unto me, where is thy God? But I will yet hope in God, because I will yet see the salvation of my Lord. He says, imagine if the deep starts crying out to the deep, and you understand you are the 42nd generation. You don't have to grow into just, just cry out for it. He says, imagine Isaiah 42. He says, oh man, hey, you got Isaiah. Maybe we should just read a few portions in Isaiah 42. I didn't want to read it. I wanted to quote it. Okay? I thought by this time you would have a, like a, hallelujah, whoa, brother, amen, say that. Wow, I take that. Woku, waka, shaka, baka. Wow, wow, woo, woo, wow, wow, wow. Okay. Yeah, riki, shiki, and biki. Zappi, zibi, dibi, dibi. He says, Thus says the Lord, verse 5, who gives breath to the people and spirit to those who walk. If the Lord called you a righteous purpose and in righteousness, I will take you by the hand. I will keep you. Verse 7, I will open the eyes of the blind. I will bring the prisoners out of the dungeon. Oh, I am the Lord. That is my name. Oh, behold, the former things have come. Verse eight, 9, new things I have declared. Before they spring forth, I will tell you. We know 43 verse 18 says that's reverse. Verse 16, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they knew not. I will make darkness light before them. I will make crooked things straight whoa man Isaiah 42 I will make darkness light I will bring you in forth in righteousness I will make the crooked places straight he says imagine Genesis 42 Jacob called his children he said I heard that there's grain in Egypt okay nobody got that so so uh, can we get the sacks and the horses and the wagons ready we're going to get some supplies Send them to Egypt and said, and, but God sent Joseph ahead. And Joseph sat there and realized all his visions and dreams are coming into fulfillment. Here comes all his brothers to buy green and bow before him. Genesis 42. So God says, how many chapters do you want to be written? Or do you want to jump into the 42nd generation? Can a man be born? What do you want to go through? Or is that not going to move you? Are you going to go for the grace and jump right into all the dreams and visions, the revelations that God has planned for you? What do you want to be? Do you want to go through stuff? Or do you know that that is just part of life and it doesn't have to touch you? Amen. Amen.